Well, look, can I start by going back briefly to um, Regulation 261 itself, which is under tab 2 of the, uh, of the authorities bundle? <coughs> Obviously, the court is endeavouring to give this a purpose of interpretation. And so it, it, it might be useful, very briefly, to refresh one's memory as to precisely what the, uh, what the regulation is designed to achieve. In fact, it's page 24, uh, yeah. the very first page. Um, recital 1, action by the community in the field of air transport should aim, amongst other things, at ensuring a high level of protection of the passengers. Moreover, full account should be taken of the requirements of consumer protection in general. So consumer protection is absolutely at the forefront of the, uh, of the regulation. Um, uh, it makes the obvious point. Denied uh, uh, boarding and cancellation or long delay of flights causes serious trouble and inconvenience to passengers. Um, recital 4, the community should therefore raise the standard of protection set by the previous regulation both to strengthen the rights of passengers and to ensure that air carriers operate under harmonised con conditions in a liberalised market. Uh, again, uh, uh, regulation, uh, uh, recital 7, in order to ensure the effective application of this regulation, the obligations that it creates should rest with the operating air carrier who performs or intends to perform a flight whether with owned aircraft, under dry or wet lease, or on any other basis. Well, Lord, this regulation applies um, to all air carriers, large or small, low cost or legacy, uh, 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 whether they operate aircraft that they own or aircraft that they lease from third party leasing companies. Um, it, it, it operates across the board. Uh, and so uh, it, it, it almost amounts to special pleading on behalf of uh, low-cost airlines like Ryanair to say that an exception should be made to the right to compensation on the basis of their business model, which is effectively what's, what's being said here. My Lord, insofar as the, the actual process by which compensation is awarded, um, your Lordships have seen that it, the amounts are very modest. The maximum amount that can be awarded to any individual passenger is €600. Euro. Yeah. Um, it, it's meant to be a summary, no-fault, quick procedure. Uh, in a sense, the, the arguments that your lordships have been listening to this morning are almost a microcosm of what might go on before a district judge in, in a case deciding whether some uh, unfortunate passenger whose flight had been delayed because of a strike uh, should, should, should or should not get 600 euro. Uh, uh, well, it's interesting perhaps to look um, at, at, at Lipton for a moment and what the court had to say there when it was dealing with difficult <laughs> arguments arising in that case in relation to um, a uh, claim based on, uh, on, on mechanical defect. Um, it's page 107 under tab 8. Sorry, Lipton? Lipton. Um, Lord Hazard, I beg your pardon, Lord Hazard. I'm sorry? It's tab 17, page 187, Lipton. Page, uh, yes, it's tab, uh, it, it's tabs, it, it's tab 17, page yeah. 107, which is, it's Huzan, I'm sorry. Huzan. Huzan. Sorry. And it's the judgment of all Justice Elias, I do beg your pardon. <clears throat> and this was in relation to an argument concerning foreseeability in the context of, um, of, 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 of disputes uh, relating to extraordinary circumstances. And it's paragraph 46. In my judgment, the potential consequences of Mr. Lawson's argument also militate against his construction. If he were right, it would open up endless debate about whether a particular technical problem should have been foreseen or not. 
This could become a critical question in many compensation claims and will potentially involve lengthy litigation with no doubt expert witnesses being called on each side. Alternatively, simply by raising the defence, the carrier will be likely to discourage inconvenienced passengers from pursuing their claims. I doubt whether the draftsman would have intended the exception to have that effect. So a construction which is on the face of it inimical to the objectives of the regulation is to be discouraged, in, uh, in, 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 in certainly on the basis of what is said um, in Lipton. My Lord, if one could then go um, uh, to, to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to effectively Lipton, uh, tab 17, page 209, in the judgment of Lord Justice, uh, Lord Justice Green in that, uh, in, in that particular instance. And my Lord, it's um, paragraph 82. In my view, regulation 261, it's about um, a, a third of the way down the page. Yep. <clears throat> in my view, regulation 26, uh, 26104, uh, as amended, does this, <coughs> provided that it is construed purposively to achieve that requisite degree of consumer protection. The judgment of Lord Justice Coulson achieves this. The claims permitted under this measure are modest. If satisfaction of such claims entail litigation in the courts, um, uh, uh, litigation of the cost would subsume the compensation within moments of a lawyer being instructed. This case has arisen as a test case of the scope of the right to compensation. Lord, litigation is to be avoided, but if, it arise, but if it arises, then it should be adjudicated upon with the principle of consumer protection well in mind on, a summary, on as summary a basis as possible. I endorse the conclusions of Lord Justice Coulson at paragraph 45-49 of this judgment, who emphasises that cases concerning compensation should be resolved with minimum cost and on the papers, if at all possible. Well, that would be impossible in the context of a case such as this in, uh, in our respectful submission. My Lord, insofar as the, uh, uh, the facts are concerned, it would be extremely difficult for a passenger to obtain evidence in any event to gainsay what an air carrier <coughs> said about the progress of, of, of negotiations uh, either with employees directly or with a trade union. Um, on a fast track, there'd be no disclosure. So be difficult to imagine how a passenger in those circumstances could obtain any evidence to contradict, for example, uh, the evidence that we have in, uh, in, in, in this particular case. Indeed, it, insofar as the Civil Avi Aviation Authority is concerned, it's even difficult for a large organisation to obtain that information because much of it would be within the peculiar knowledge of the air carrier concerned because, of course, they were at the coalface conducting uh, the negotiation. Uh, whether they could get some help from the unions, well, who would know? But again, it would massively complicate the process of litigation and could, in fact, render uh, the whole scheme ineffective in, in the case of strikes if one had to carry out that sort of investigation. Well, can I, before I actually go to the particular circumstances... And yet strikes are specifically mentioned in, reti in recital 14. Well, no, no, absolutely. Um, it's, it, it, it's extremely difficult. Of course, there is a level of investigation that has to be carried out, and there are certain key questions that any court would need to ask. But of course, in those circumstances, those questions in, in, in our respectful submission are relatively straightforward and are basically uh, 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 capable of a, of a relatively straightforward answer. The first question would be, who went on strike? Was it, was, it, was it a strike by the employees of the air carrier? What was the reason for the strike? In other words, was it a strike related to pay or working conditions, or was it related to something else? Those are simple questions to answer in the same way, for example, that if a foreign object is on a runway, um, uh, uh, that is capable. Of, and, and an aircraft is damaged as a result. Very, very simple questions, very, very straightforward. 
there will be a, a record at the airport, presumably. The uh, question would be, was there a foreign body on the runway? Whose foreign body was it? Was it, was it that of the, uh, uh, of the operating carrier, or was it that of another carrier? Uh, uh, thirdly, um, uh, uh, did the aircraft sustain damage? Fourthly, did the captain of the aircraft uh, 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 abort takeoff or, or, or execute a go around? So coming coming back to strikes, or yes, who went on strike? Who went on strike? Answer the employees of the air carrier. Yes. What was the reason for the strike? Well, answer pay and conditions. End of inquiry. Uh, not necessarily. Um, if it, if it did relate to pay and conditions, yes. But if it related, if it were, for example, a sympathy strike. Or if it were, for example, a, um, a, a strike that was related to, say, a, a political motive, a call for a general strike, yes, that would be a relatively simple inquiry because that would be a matter of record. Uh, the newspapers would have it, apart from anything else. But of course, the, the details, of the minutiae of negotiations such as these um, uh, uh, would, would be very, very difficult to, um, uh, to, 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 to obtain evidence about. So the consumer is disadvantaged in two ways. Firstly, there's a disincentive for 600 euro. It, it, it's hardly worth going to the expense unless you're on a crusade. It does happen. But for the, the average consumer, which of course is, is uh, the normal uh, uh, test in EU law, it would be a, a virtually insurmountable yeah. hurdle and just not worth the effort. So the construction in the context of strikes, uh, uh, certainly strikes that are uh, 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 said to be uh, uh, so damaging as to be as to create an existential risk to the air carrier, which is virtually what is said here. Although we know ultimately that um, the strike will resolve, and I'm going to take your lordships in a little more detail to precisely how they were resolved in um, in due course and what happened in Mr. Hughes's um, his statement. But uh, uh, as far as it goes. In order to achieve the sort of resolution that the uh, that the regulation is 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 or, or sort of a, uh, uh, result that the regulation is seeking to achieve, uh, one needs to avoid uh, a complex litigation, and this is all, one cannot have a district judge sitting um, a, as an industrial relations tribunal. Yeah. It, it's just utterly inimical to the um, uh, to the both the framework and the objectives of, of the regulation. So that, that's, that's my first point uh, in relation to that. Uh, the point I also make is that, of course, it, the whole question of, of, of what actually conditioned the strike, in other words, was it something done by the, uh, by the employer or was it something uh, 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 sprung on them, as it were, by the, uh, by, by the union or by the employees, um, is a red herring in our respectful submission. Um, Posing the question, uh, 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 it's one I think that um, the court posed uh, right at the beginning of uh, my learned friend's opening. Suppose the court was seized of precisely the same circumstances, in other words, precisely the same demands, uh, precisely the same degree of intransigence on the part of the employees with no union involvement at all. Um, What's the difference if, if, the, um, if the impetus comes from the union? It may be that employees, for example, with, with, with no restructuring going on, simply um, uh, uh, take a look. And I, I think, as my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Snowden remarked, it, it may be a pay. It may simply arise in the context of, a, of an annual pay round. Um, if uh, employees look around and see what other air carriers are paying pilots for similar uh, uh, employment and think, well, Ryanair is below par or British Airways is below par and then decide to make a demand uh, uh, for, for higher pay. Well, that, that, that should make no difference uh, 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 to a situation that arises through a restructuring decision taken by the airline itself, I suppose one could say. It's the action of the airline in refusing the demand that's made that triggers the strike. But the fact that it, it emanates from a union should, should make no difference in our respectful submission whatsoever. Ryanair decided to let unions in. Their previous business model had been a non-union <coughs> business 
and they decided to move to a, 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 a union recognized business model. Um, now, that, in a sense, is bound to open Pandora's box, because, of course, unions are obviously there to represent the interests of their members, but they can't be heard to complain if then they are faced with, um, uh, 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 with demands that they find it difficult to meet. Um, it, it's part of the normal cut and thrust of, of negotiations that a union or indeed a workforce may start with, uh, with, with an unreasonable, even an outrageous demand. That's their opening gambit. As I understand, as I understand it, by, oh, the time, yeah. by the time there was a strike, the employees had been balloted. Well, that I think I think that's right. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I must say, but I don't know. But certainly, I, we've worked on the basis that the union had a, had a mandate, basically, from the from, from, from the employees. Would it need? I'm not an expert in this. Area, <laughs> would you need to have had a ballot to make it a lawful strike? The Lord, um, uh, that's a bit outside my expertise too. Not being um, more so, it's a question of Irish law, isn't it? Not <laughs> well, my Lord. <laughs> Possibly, possibly, in, in the circumstances. Just as I think Cruzman, the whole thing turned on, 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 on the particular provisions of German law in that case. Um, well, uh, except it didn't, it, because the court said that wasn't relevant. But yes. <laughs> My lord, it, it's, um, if, if a union starts with an unreasonable demand, that, that's part of the cut and thrust of, um, of, 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 of negotiation. Yeah, no, we've, we've got that point. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I can move on, I think, from, uh, for, for, from that. Lord, what actually happened in the case? Could I invite your lordships to uh, go to uh, Mr. Hugh's statement, which, <laughs> is, uh, which is under tab 12 of the supplementary bundle? Uh, no, I don't think so. That's the um, press release. Well, it, it's a supplementary bundle. It's part five of the supplementary bundle. Page seventy-seven, paragraph sixty-two. This is where he actually sets out what happened in relation to the eleven demands that the Forcer Union made. You're on page seventy. I'm on, I'm on page seventy-seven. <coughs> seventy-seven. Seventy-seven, uh, paragraph sixty-two of his statement. Um, to be needs to have five. So demand one, a single agreed master <coughs> seniority list, the MSL, that will contain and apply all our member pilots directly employed by Ryanair. Um, when we initially reviewed this point, we were not sure what force we were looking for. It goes on to detail the course of the negotiations, but perhaps what matters for these purposes um, uh, 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 can, can be looked at um, uh, over the page, page 78, at the end of paragraph 62, 1.1. While it could be said that the Irish Union and Irish pilots had a legitimate interest in knowing the seniority list of pilots in Ireland, they had no legitimate interest in knowing the seniority of pilots in other countries. We explained this point to Forcer, who agreed to accept that the MSL will be limited to the Irish pilot. So there's a negotiation going on, yeah. uh, leading to <coughs> compromise and leading to, in fact, a, uh, 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 an accommodation being reached on that particular demand. Uh, demand two, um, uh, uh, again, the same thing happened there. It was in respect of Irish-based pilots only. Uh, my Lord, demand three, um, uh, similar again, a single bid form for base transfers, clearly showing all our member pilots directly employed by Ryanair, captain and co-pilot positions um, in each base. There was considerable discussion uh, around this point. There is an employer exercising uh, a, a measure of control and uh, uh, participating fully in, in negotiations with the union. And uh, what is the result? Well. It says it took several rounds of negotiations, page 78, um, uh, uh, 60, uh, uh, 62.3.1. It took several rounds of negotiations before the union was able to articulate precisely what it was seeking. Ultimately, when, during mediation, Ryanair explained the operational complexities 
displaying the number of vacancies, the union dropped its demand. So again, accommodation reached. Um, same in relation to uh, demand for um, uh, an agreed transparent mechanism for entry onto the agreed NSL, which will have due regard for the date of entry into Ryanair. Um, this point was eventually accepted by Corsa during the mediation that eventually took place in August 2018, resolved. Uh, demand 5, an agreed transparent mechanism of appeal for establishing our member pilots directly employed by Ryanair. Um, uh, uh, again, during the 9th of July meeting, Ryanair showed force that Irish pilots were already able to appeal any company decision through the established grievance procedures, but include a number of steps to resolving any internal disputes as in court. <coughs> Lord, one can go on and establish that in relation to most of those demands, there was a great compromise. I don't propose to take you yeah. through, uh, through all of it. Um, um, but, but that is not a union out of control with uh, an employer able to exercise no control. That is something which is part of the day-to-day -day operation of, 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 hu of the management of human resources within a, 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 an airline. And uh, I, I, again, that, that is, um, I, I, is not an example in our respectful submission of something amounting to exceptional, uh, extraordinary circumstances. Uh, it simply cannot, does not meet uh, the first test of inherency. It, 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 it's there. Well, in relation to other points, if I can perhaps um, tie in the, uh, the analogy that's drawn with the, with the disruptive passenger. Um, that's the, the case of, uh, of LE. Um, again, in the case of a disruptive passenger, that is capable in terms of determining whether it falls within the scope of extraordinary circumstances or not of a relatively uh, uncomplicated answer, an examination by a court. First question. What did the passenger do? Uh, well, uh, if the answer is um, he was trying to open the door of the flight deck or he was trying to um, open an escape hatch in flight, um, uh, that's a, 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 a very straightforward um, answer. One is not likely to see detailed questions arising um, about how far. The very fact that the pilot felt the need to divert the flight. Well, in LE, he bit another passenger and then assaulted. Well, absolutely. Him. Well, that, that would be another reason. He assaulted the crew, assaulted the passengers, um, uh, uh, lit up a cigarette when he shouldn't have done, and, and, and obviously caused huge disruption. All of those things, very, very straightforward answers, um, and, and would not result in, um, in, in, in any lengthy litigation or expensive litigation. At, might, might you not have a rather more complicated inquiry if you had to work out whether the airline could bear responsibility? Uh, well, you know, had they served him one drink too many, should they have noticed that he was swaying a bit as he came up the um, steps? That would, that would be a different matter, obviously, yes. Uh, or if they'd served him with alcohol in flight. Um, but again, that would have been something, presumably, that would have been observed by the passengers themselves on the, <coughs> on the flight. Um, if someone, in fact, the passengers themselves might have had more of an opportunity to um, uh, judge the behaviour of that passenger than the airline. Because the airline, for example, if, if uh, as some airlines uh, subcontract their passenger handling uh, uh, to an external source, uh, they might not see the passenger until he's actually on the aeroplane. Whereas the passengers themselves might well be in the terminal with that passenger. Well, that's all going to be very fact sensitive. Look, and that very, doesn't very really help your point. Your point is it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be fact sensitive. Fact no, sensitive. no, in those circumstances. But it is. It is relatively straightforward. I'm not sure that's right. Actually, if um, the airplane is diverted from its intended destination because of an Amuli passenger, mm -hmm. it's the people who are at the intended destination who are due to be picked up and brought back. Who are going to have their flight cancelled? Yes, and possibly. They will yes. know nothing about what has caused the cancellation of their flight, other yeah. than their plane hasn't turned well, up might, and they're stranded. But for those passengers who are on the diverted flight themselves, it may it may be such a long delay in arriving at their destination that it becomes tantamount to a, a well, cancellation. I suspect it won't be a long delay. Well, it, it may be, but uh, but I mean the, the the assumption that passengers would readily know what has caused the problem. Um, I, I'm not sure is not not doesn't always apply. No, I I, I accept that. 
So, my lord, that, that I think deals with, um, uh, with my submissions in relation to, um, uh, uh, to that. Can I uh, turn now uh, to Cruzman and, and look critically? Because obviously, your lordship's rightly remarked that Cruzman was, um, uh, 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 Cruzman and Valentin Herman are the key cases in this regard. And could I invite your lordships to go to Cruzman, which is tab 12 of the authorities? page 145, and those key paragraphs um, that, 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 that appear there. Yeah. Furthermore, given the, I'm going to 36, furthermore, given the objective of regulation uh, number 261-2004, which is to ensure, it is apparent from recital 1 thereof, a high level of protection for passengers, and the fact that Article 5.1 of that regulation derogates from the principle of the right to compensation for passengers in the event of cancellation or substantial delay of a flight, the concept of extraordinary circumstances within the meaning of that paragraph must be strictly interpreted. 38. Um, in the present case, is it apparent from the files submitted that, to the court that the wildcat strike among the staff of the air carrier concern has its origins in the carrier's surprise announcement of a corporate restructuring process? That announcement led for a period of approximately one week to a particularly high rate of staff flight absenteeism as a result of a call relayed not by staff representatives of the undertaking, but spontaneously by the workers themselves who place themselves on sick leave. And it, it's paragraph 39 that um, I, I would draw your Lordship's attention to in particular. That is, it is not disputed that the wildcat strike was triggered by the staff of Twee Fly in order for it to set out its claims, in this case relating to the restructuring measures announced by the management of that air carrier. But that could be the case um, with any other aspect of the, uh, of the operation um, in terms of human resources of the air carrier's uh, 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 um, business. So in those circumstances, if, for example, it related to uh, uh, pay or it related to conditions and uh, a demand were made, uh, and, and strike action were taken in order to set out a claim, that would in fact still be on all fours with the, with the decision in Cruzman. <coughs> and that's what was happening effectively in, 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 in this case. The, um, the union was setting out the claims that it was making on behalf of the workforce, a and it did so by making certain demands, the 11 demands, which were the subject of negotiation, Negotiations broke down, which again is um, uh, uh, goes with the territory. That that happens um, or, or on a not infrequent basis, and that led to the the cancellation of the strikes. But then to conduct a detailed analysis of who was right, who was wrong, it's uh, a, a, a little bit like the uh, injunction against inquiring into whether uh, a mechanical defect was uh, foreseeable, not foreseeable. Some mechanical defects may be capable of swift resolution. Some may take longer to, uh, to, to resolve. Mr. Kennelly's point is actually simpler. He just simply says, um, don't worry about how the negotiations went. It's clear that what kicked off this, the, the strikes was the demand from the union for the 11... Um, Proposals. The, 11, the 11 demands. Uh, demands. They were, yes, absolutely. Um, so he says you don't need to get into anything else. It's perfectly clear. Contrast mm -hmm. Cruzman, where what kicked off the, the strikes was the airline saying, we're just going to restructure without warning. That's the contrast that I think he draws with Cruzman. Well, Lord, yes. Uh, but in my respect and submission, it, 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 it's a contrast, again, Without a, without a real difference, because it still relates to something that's inherent in the operation of the air carrier's activities. Um, and, and it's still something uh, that is not out with their control, in the sense that, that by engaging in negotiations with the union over those demands, uh, they are exercising um, a power 
to influence events. They may not influence them ultimately precisely uh, as they would wish, but they are not powerless to influence those events. They're, they're in negotiation with the union, and, uh, and, 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 and to that extent, they have control, a degree of control. No one has total control over the negotiation, but they have a degree of control over those negotiations. So it, 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 in my respectful submission, uh, uh, it, it, this case is really, in terms of principle, um, uh, not distinguishable from the circumstances in Cruzman. So do you say that the, the fact that what triggers the debate between the employees and the employer over terms and conditions or operating procedures or anything like it, the fact that it may be an external factor is neither here nor there. Like neither here nor there in the circumstances. But Lord, suppose that factor, um, or, or suppose those demands have been made by the, the, the employees themselves, then, then that, that one wouldn't have that argument being made. It can't make a difference in our respective submission that they're made by, uh, by a union that, that, that is acting on behalf of the, of the membership. Um, it, 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 it's no, I don't think that was the question you were being asked. Um, the question you were being asked was what kicked it off. Yes. Uh, well, if we go back to the two questions you said were the yeah. relevant questions, who went on strike, who answer, strike? Ryanair, staff, yeah. what was the reason for the strike, you say, answer, pay and conditions. Pay and conditions. And I think if, that, if you give that answer to your second question, I think you say, well, that's the end of the inquiry. It's only if you answer the inquiry, no, it was about yeah. something else, that you might have to go on to consider what it was and... And, 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 and go into the minutiae, yes, Lord. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's the other point I make. Um, <coughs> My Lord, as, as I've indicated, all of the um, all of the other cases uh, where it, it, it's interesting to note that the uh, the number of cases where extraordinary circumstances have been found to exist is is, is relatively limited. I, I I think it was remarked in Husar that there's not a single case of mechanical failure, for example, that was found to be an extraordinary circumstance. Uh, that must be right. Um, Stewart, I suppose, is a crossover case. Your Lordship will recall the facts of Stewart. Stewart was a case where an aircraft was damaged as a result of a collision with um, a boarding staircase. The boarding staircase was actually operated by a third party. It was operated, I think, by the airport or, or, or by one of the, um, one of the handlers um, who, uh, who operated at the airport themselves. Uh, and, and again, although that was uh, an external circumstance, it was found not to be um, uh, extraordinary circumstances. The court again held that uh, the operation of boarding stairs are integral to the operation of an aircraft, because without it, for obvious reasons, the passengers can't get on and off. And it didn't matter <coughs> that the uh, uh, staircase in that case was operated by a, by a third party. Um, so, so it does matter if you leave a screw on the runway, yeah. or indeed leave a, a screw immediately behind the tyre of the mm. plane when it's standing being boarded, such that it punctures its tyre when it reverses out. Mm. But if you ram the plane with the uh, staircase, is a different result? Well, Lord, that seems to be. The, 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 the result of the decision in, uh, in, in, in Seward. I mean, just to be clear, <laughs> presumably that wouldn't be the case of a terrorist ran the no, ran certainly not. The, the stairs. <laughs> no, because that, well, that would be, an, that would be a, a security consideration, I suppose, within the meaning of, um, of, recital, of recital 14. Or, for example, um, if a terrorist on board the aircraft pulled out a gun, that would be much more than a, a mere disruptive passenger. Um, that would that would come fairly and squarely within uh, within extraordinary circumstances, because that would be something totally out with um, the operation of the air carrier's activity. Um, obviously, one knows that uh, from time to time terrorists do actually manage to get through and board aircraft, but um, that's so far out with 
<coughs> that may be nothing to do with carrier at all. That may be due to the airport's uh, uh, lack of security or, or, or whatever. Can, well, can we just they actually say that in Stuart in paragraph 19? <coughs> can we just try cutting the two a moment? The terms and conditions and the terrorists. Yeah. Or something similar. Um, suppose there were a territory in the world where there were active terrorists um, who the staff perceived were liable to fire missiles and shoot down the plane. Uh, and the staff therefore said, we want uh, um, flights routed away from that area. Um, so they're, they're, they're making a demand relating to their conditions, but it's prompted by a terrorist threat. Is, where, where do you stand on that? Well, Lord, that would that would be an that would be an extraordinary circumstance. Uh, it, it, it's very. <sighs> there is actually a, a, a well a, a case that's not exactly on all fours with that, but many many years ago, your lordship may remember when the first Gulf War broke out, British Airways flew um, a Boeing seven four seven into Kuwait. Um, and there'd been a great deal of, of and, and the passengers were all taken hostage uh, by the then regime, um, uh, uh, the Iraqi regime, <coughs> and held as, uh, uh, as human shields. Um, that was a very long time ago. I think, uh, I think it certainly predates uh, the regulation in this case. Well, we've seen other such incidents. I mean, we saw a Russian airliner shot down in Egypt. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, aircraft diverted to Belarus so that Mr. Well, Navalny could be seized by the Russians. Uh, we saw the Malaysian aircraft shot down over Ukraine. Yeah. I mean, it happens. Yes, and, and of course, although it, it, it may be it, it may be predictable, it has happened, but it's so far out with um, uh, the operation of the operating carrier's activities that it it, it, it would have to fall square fairly and squarely. Within uh, within recital fourteen, e well, even though it wasn't the threat itself that prompted the cancellation, it no. was a strike that had been triggered by the threat. Yeah. So yes. so to to follow this question, um, if Ryanair staff say we no longer want to fly to eastern Poland because it's rather close to Ukraine and there's a lot of potential instability in and around Ukraine at the moment. You say what? Well, the Lord. Then again, that would be a that would be a flight safety consideration, I suppose, within the meaning of recital fourteen, and that would, in in those circumstances, um, that would have nothing. I say it would have nothing. The actual cause of the diversion might flow from a decision. This is sort of diversion. They yeah. just they just it's say, not flying there. Civil Aviation Authority yeah. have said. No problem. Ryanair says, you know, it's Poland. The staff just say, we don't want to get on the plane. We're just going to, we're just not going to fly. Well, in those circumstances, I suppose that would, no, that 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 would not come within the scope of extraordinary circumstances. That would be that with the staff taking their own their own decision in those circumstances, um, and, and wouldn't come within the scope of extraordinary circumstances. But that that. With respect, that's not the case. Not really the case. Here. No, no. But I, I think we're just yeah. testing the um, limits, <laughs> yeah, the, or the boundary between yeah. the threat of the the uh, staff who say we're not going to fly somewhere near where there are terrorist threats, mm -hmm. which you uh, thought accepted was extraordinary circumstances, and the staff who don't want to fly near a potential war zone, which mm -hmm. you say is not. The Lord. Again, it, it I suppose illustrates the difficult value judgments that, 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 that would have to be made in in, in, in those cases. Well, by a district judge mm -hmm. sitting, by a district in judge sitting, or, or sitting, or uh, uh, deciding on whether to award six hundred euro in compensation. But, but I thought you said we should interpret it so that those aren't the sort of judgments that have to be made by district judges sitting hearing six hundred euro. Well, well, that's rights. why I've indicated in those circumstances it might not amount to exceptional to, to extraordinary circumstances. Well, I think within the framework of your two questions, what was the reason for the strike? Mm -hmm. Answer, because the crew was worried about flight safety over flying yeah. a particular country. Um, you would have answered your second question. You would have answered your second question not by reference, not, not solely by reference mm -hmm. to pay and conditions, but by something. 
And it may be that at that point, the district judge would have to take a, a value judgment yes. on whether that was or wasn't extraordinary. But presumably taking the reason for the strike at face value and yeah. saying, given that that was the reason for the strike, is that an extraordinary circumstance or not, without necessarily going further into an further investigation? Into, well, yes. I, I, the, the authorities stress that, that where um, recital 14 cases are, are, are involved, then uh, a, a, a slightly more detailed analysis might be called for but certainly not uh, uh, one equivalent to a, to, to a trial of, of, of um, uh, negotiations between an employer and, a, yeah. and an employer. So, I mean, you, you, you would say, well, that there is, there is a spectrum. Yeah. Uh, on the one hand, there's, we want more pay. Yes. Um, at one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, there's, we are striking in sympathy with somebody else. Yes. It's got nothing to do with our pay and conditions. And there may be a middle ground where it is partly to do with our pay and conditions, but there are other reasons as well, such as concerns over safety, overflying some particular territory in the world, yes. where the court would simply what make just make a value judgment. Yes. Well, it would it, uh, it would ask the question. What it probably wouldn't get with you to would be whether there was objectively justification for what for what happened because then then one would get into a um, a very very detailed analysis which would not be consistent with the with the scheme and you, you would say I suppose that in deciding whether or not these are extraordinary circumstances you would have to bear in mind that it's an exception and therefore is to be narrowly interpreted yes as is the way <clears throat> the objective is consumer protection. Well, yes, and that in that context, that that trumps everything. Um, it's um, well, it doesn't trump everything. Not, not everything, but they can it, it trumps the particular circumstances there. Well, yes. My lord, I'm a little shorter uh, uh, than I anticipated. But sorry, that is, um, uh, and you say, well, I think you also say, well, whatever might be. The, result in cases such as we've just been debating. Um, there's no parallel with simply the union getting involved on behalf of some of its members. However reasonable or unreasonable, or unreasonable that, that somebody might be. perceive them to be making demands. Oh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Dahan. Yes, Mr. Cannon, you wish to reply? I do, uh, my lord. Yes, um, and, but reflecting on the brevity of Mr. Dahan's submissions, my reply will be commensurately brief. Um, the <clears throat> well, you had all the legwork to do, taking us through all these places. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, no, I'm quite. Um, the the first point that um, my own friend made was that consumer protection is at the forefront of how the regulation ought to be approached. And this takes a point put to me at the end of my submissions by Lord Newey about ultimately which construction is better for consumers in the United Kingdom. And there's a point in the evidence, no need to take you to it, it's, it's self-evident, that a construction, the construction adopted by the CAA and the learned judge below, um, does risk leading to perverse incentives on the part of the airlines. Because as my Lord saw in Regulation 261, this compensation obligation applies to cancellations that happen two weeks before the flight is due to take off. Um, if you cancel your flight outside that two-week window, 15 days before takeoff, you're not liable for compensation for this. And so this extreme, which I, which I submit is an extreme construction urged upon you by the CAA, means that airlines are then encouraged, if they foresee trouble, if there is potentially an industrial dispute that's likely to arise, it is safer to cancel at least some of the flights that would be in issue so as to reduce the exposure the airline inevitably faces, bearing in mind the negotiating power of the union, if, regardless of how unreasonable they're being, if a strike takes place, the airline will be on the hook. But the whole point is that if they do it sufficiently far in advance, um, A, they've got to refund in any event, 
be the people who are flying can make alternative arrangements for these books. Indeed, but the compens but but the the compensation payment liability is a significant one. And if airlines cancel their flights two weeks, fifteen days before takeoff, they now go with perceiving potentially an industrial problem arising. Uh, they will obviously have to reimburse and, and reroute. That can be an awful lot cheaper than having to pay out 200 or 400 euros per passenger if the cancellation happens within the two-week window. It yeah. perversely encourages airlines to bring forward cancellations, to cancel, it, to cancel further in advance. Now, you might say, my lord, that that uh, doesn't inconvenience passengers as much because they have two weeks to make alternative arrangements. But in reality, consumers will suffer a severe prejudice if that happens. Bear in mind holidays. And <coughs> it, it encourages airlines to cancel flights earlier. And that obviously is not good for consumers. The next point my I've made was um, the degree of factual inquiry. He urges upon you the CAA's construction because he says anything else involves um, an inappropriate degree of uh, factual scrutiny. <coughs> and he took you to uh, Hazar and Lipton. Um, I hope you've seen from my submissions, there's no question here in relation to these cases of ever needing lengthy litigation involving expert witnesses, as suggested in Hazar. Um, Claimants should not be discouraged in making these compensation claims, even if my construction is right. It costs them nothing to claim these compensation payments. Um, there's no cost penalty if ultimately the judge reviews the evidence from the airline and decides uh, that there were extraordinary circumstances. There's no cost penalty for the, the claimant. Because it's on the small track. Indeed, my lord, yes. <clears throat> and so there's no way claimants should be discouraged. It's always worthwhile making a claim. Um, and in, in, as I said in opening, in, in all these cases, it's for the airline to prove to the court that <coughs> extraordinary circumstances apply. The burdens on it, it needs to produce um, contemporaneous documents to persuade the court that it, it's a genuine extraordinary circumstance. It's a difficult test to satisfy as the court has seen. The passenger really has no role at all, but that's the nature of the test. And. Uh, that was clear from the exchange between Learner Friend and Lord of Snowden um, in the case of the, the plane that has been disrupted. It's the passengers in the destination airport who are going to be uh, suffering. They have no idea what's happened. Um, but they will know once the cancellation occurs, as, because it's a sticker on every check-in desk in every airport in Europe, that you have a right to make a claim. And ultimately, they may be told, unbeknownst to you, there was some extraordinary circumstance, like a bird strike. Uh, but the passenger will get the money depending on the assessment made by the court taken inevitably on a broad brush level. Um, and we get that also from... Um, and of course, I'm reminded, the test is two parts. It's not just extraordinary circumstances, but also reasonable measures. Yeah. And reasonable measures is, by definition, a fact-sensitive question. Um, but nevertheless, these cases may be determined on the papers. And because, as I said, it's for the airline with proper documents to satisfy the court. And that's why it's inappropriate simply to say, to ask, as my own friend suggested, who went on strike and was a strike about pay and terms and conditions, and that's the end of it. Um, we know from the Cruzman case it's appropriate to ask further questions, and they can be asked without detailed factual scrutiny. And the question to ask is, to paraphrase the question from the court, what kicked it off? Take, take the reason for the strike at face value. That would be an appropriate thing to do, since the burden's on the airline. And the district judge will uh, decide what the origin of the strike ultimately was <coughs> and apply that to the test. And the disruptive, pa the disruptive passenger in LE and TAP is a very good example uh, as to how this factual inquiry can take place. Because if my owner friend is right that it would be inappropriate or even impossible to have any kind of factual inquiry beyond who's striking and was it about their terms and conditions. We see from the disruptive passenger example how on the court's approach, the Court of Justice's approach, some factual inquiry is required. And it's not just was he really disruptive, but also did the airline contribute. That doesn't can that I involves a fact. Can you just help me with this? <clears throat> you quite rightly said reasonable measures comes into it. But you don't get to reasonable measures unless you've got extraordinary circumstances. My lord, yes. When you are asking, could the airline have stopped the unruly 
Are you really asking whether that is extraordinary circumstances? Or are you really asking, were there reasonable measures that the airline could have taken to stop the passengers becoming unruly? In, in, they're separate questions. In, in reality... According the, to regulation, they are. But, but, yeah, but, in the, but that, that rather seems to blur the distinction, doesn't it? The facts, the evidence the airline will produce for both would be very similar, but they are separate stages of the analysis. And so, for extraordinary circumstances, the airline will have to show that, notwithstanding the fact that drunk passengers get on planes every day, um, this person, for example, couldn't have been perceived, or um, it was, for whatever reason, impossible to tell that he was uh, intoxicated. And once on the plane, um, the airline did not contribute to his further behaviour. <coughs> or, or they might, they might have the airline might at that stage have the benefit of some police report um, after the event, which will demonstrate that he had a problems that had nothing to do with uh, alcohol or anything like that. They could then prey in any. Again, very difficult for the airline to show extraordinary circumstances in, in the case of a passenger. But it does uh, require some factual um, investigation for the purposes of the first stage, the extraordinary circumstances stage. But again, the airline would have, to, would have to satisfy the court that they did not serve this intoxicated passenger any more alcohol, and that, they, and, and that their ability to deal with him was inhibited because, for example, he was violent and it wasn't reasonable to expect the staff to deal with him. And that's, that's all uh, possible to resolve on the papers before a district judge. The airline has to satisfy the court, burdens on it, the passenger has really only a passive role, which again is appropriate in this summary system, and the airline will have an uphill battle, but if it has the right material, it will succeed on that point. Um, my own friend's next point was on inherency and the cause of the strikes, and the fact he says that the union makes no difference that it shouldn't make any difference whether it's the workers without a union who take action or whether it's a union that um, decides on their behalf that that's the appropriate step to take. Uh, you have my submissions on that and why the union does constitute an external factor. Yeah. But in my submission, there is a tension between that point the Malone friend makes and his next point, which is that Ryanair brought these unions on themselves. His point is, if these unions are intransigent and unreasonable, more intr intransigent than the employees on their own form of the union. You brought that on yourself. Now, there we submit as an implicit acceptance that the union does introduce an, uh, an external additional factor which changes the dynamic. And that, in our respectful submission, is a factor pointing towards this being in substance an, ex an external event extraneous to the uh, normal operations of the um, my Lord, my friend, my Lord, my friend took you to Cruzman. Uh, I'm not going to repeat my submissions on that. Uh, the, the reading he gives of it simply isn't how the court expressed their reasoning. Um, as, as I said, the court of justice expresses itself in terse language. We assume that every clause has been carefully chosen and haggled over between the judges in the, in the chamber and therefore has to be given weight. And we can't simply read out um, inconvenient passages. So therefore, the reference to paragraphs 38 and 39 <coughs> must be treated as having significant significance. Because on my own friend's submission, all disputes are inherent. And every strike that results is inherent, regardless how unreasonable uh, the uh, union being. And that brought us to the exchange uh, between my, my Lord Ross Newey and Lord Ross Snowden about positing other situations which may or may not amount to extraordinary circumstances. And this question of what if um, the staff threatened to strike because they felt it was inappropriate to fly to uh, airports close to the border between Poland and Belarus. Um, and that's a, that is a classic example, we would say, of something that is extraordinary circumstances. What has kicked this off? It's no action taken by the airline. The airline's been flying, flies to Poland all the time. The CAA says it's a safe thing to do. The staff has decided that they don't want to do it, they think it's uh, unsafe, um, and they strike as a result. That's an extremely unusual occurrence. Frequency isn't determinative, but one can have a broad regard to but, it. But why isn't that just the staff just saying, you are requiring us to do something as part of our terms and conditions of employment, um, which you shouldn't be requiring us to do? 
I mean, why isn't that just part part of the general cut and thrust of industrial relations? It's just like you know, saying you're you're saying we can't take coffee breaks for longer than ten minutes. It, it goes ultimately to the question of uh, the responsibility for for the strike. The starting point is that Recital Fourteen suggests that strikes are extraordinary circumstances, and therefore. When, when an external union um, goes on strike, prima facie, that is an extraordinary circumstance. It's something happening outside of the control of the airline. It isn't, you have my submission, part of the... S sorry, sorry, when an, ex you said when an external union... Calls a strike. Calls a strike, sorry. Um, prima facie, that's extraordinary circumstances. Here, our case, we say is... Sorry, but it wasn't... When you say an ex sorry, it's when you said an ex... An ex ex I just need to unpack that sentence. An external union calls a strike. As I understand it, the strikes were um, took place following a ballot of the employee. Yes, yes. I mean, the, my lord, you have my point. I accept that the the, the employees endorsed the strike. The, I, I refer to the union again and again, not to suggest that somehow the employees uh, are uninvolved, but it's the I have to refer to the union because it's the introduction of the union we say that introduces this further external factor. But whether it's the union or the employees, it doesn't matter because the thing that kicked off the strike isn't on cruise money, isn't some, some act by the airline. It is their decision unilaterally not to fly to these particular destinations. And, and if even if you're not with me on that, one asks it, following LE and TAP, uh, has the airline contributed to this situation? To what extent are the, are the employees being disruptive, unreasonably disruptive, and to what extent does the airline contribute? And there, uh, if, for example, there was um, a, a missile attack such as we saw in Ukraine shortly before, and the CA was being was delayed, took action eventually, but not at the relevant time, the district judge might think, well, actually, uh, Ryanair ought to have reacted to that and the employees were within their rights to do it, perhaps that's not akin to the unruly disruptive passenger. <coughs> They're not disruptive in that sense and therefore I will not treat this as extraordinary circumstances. He, he or she will take a view. But, but prima facie, it is extraordinary circumstances, we would say, um, based on the factors that would be in play in that situation. And that value judgment that the district judge has to take is, is one that can be taken on a summary basis. burden being on the airline and it being a, a higher burden to satisfy. Remember, I mean, my lord, I can see that the one, one thinks that seems rather unfair. It seems to, it seems to um, reward unreasonable behavior on the part of the airline. But that, the reasonableness of the airline will be in play when the judge comes to assess whether these are extraordinary circumstances or not. The problem with my friend's construction is that grossly unreasonable behavior on the part of the union will be ignored. That's the problem, is that, is that if, if the CAA is correct and the learned judge below is correct, and, and I, I don't pull these out of the air as, as ridiculous examples, an, air, an airline, and this is not just Ryanair, this is any UK airline, any, any airline, not just based in the UK, that flies out of UK airports, could have staff members, small category of staff members, that could make in a demand of a 100% pay rise, three day week, anything at all, completely impossible to satisfy, and a strike follows, and the airline is liable to pay compensation to passengers. Uh, and, the, and with the best will in the world, that powerful uh, economic tool in the hand of unreasonable employees um, is not the intended outcome of the regulation. But, but in that case, is this right, it doesn't matter whether it's a demand stoked by a union or just by a few disgruntled employees, you say you've got to test the unreasonableness of the demand. Indeed, indeed. And, and so I don't need, I mean, I've made my, my union point is the, the first point I make in my submissions, this external factor. But I, even if you're against me on that, yeah. it's still necessary to ask what kicked it off. And then one asks, um, is the behavior as disruptive? Is it akin to the level of disruption we saw in LE and TAP? Yeah. And my Lord, so before I sit down, Very grateful, that's my submission. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Well, thank you very much for your interesting submissions. Uh, the case obviously has wider ramifications. So we will consider our judgments. Uh, you will receive a draft in the usual way, which will be your opportunity to correct our English, but not our reasoning. And we would hope that in the light of the draft judgment, you will be able to agree a formal order. If you can't agree a formal order, please make short written submissions, and we will make the order that we think is appropriate. Thank you both very much. Thank you.